All right, so today we're going to be looking at, you're going to be looking at um, mechanical energy um, from a different standpoint. We've talked about non-conservative. Now we're going to be looking at power, um, finish looking at power and look at energy exchanges, non-conservative forces. We're going to take a deeper dive into non-conservative forces. So... All right, today we're going to be looking at power and non-conservative forces. So let's start, let's cruise on. What is the definition of power with power? Power is defined, if you look at it, let's make this a little bit smaller here. Power is defined as the rate at which work is done. So if we were to look at this and actually say, okay, what's the formula? Big P is for power, and this is work divided by time. All right, there's also another type of formula that we can look at. If we look at power is work over time, well, work is what? And we're going to do this as one over time. Work is force times distance, isn't it? So this really becomes force times distance over time. Well, distance over time we know is velocity. So there's two options for the power formula. The first option is work over time, and the second object, option is power is equal to force times velocity. That's also a possible option. So you've got two formulas here. One of the things you're also going to need to know is most of the time when we talk about in our um, context, when we talk about power, we look at it either in terms of watts, which is like if you look at your energy bill. But if you're talking mechanical stuff, typically we use horsepower. Well, the conversion factor between the two is right here. One horsepower is equal to 746 watts. Now guys, you don't know this. Now if you need to use it on the test, it'll be given to you on the test or I'll tell you. And it's not on your purple sheet and if they wanted you to use it, they would also give it to you on the AP test. So don't worry about memorizing that part, okay? So let's cruise on and look how we can apply this. So we have an electrical motor lifts an elevator. So we've got a distance it's lifted right here so this is our distance um, we've got a time right and we've got a force well if we know um, power it wants to know what's the power well power is equal to work divided by time or work which is force time distance divided by time so let's plug that in we know the force is 12,000 newtons we know the distance it is is nine meters right and we're gonna divide that by the amount of time, which is 15 seconds. If we do that and we work it out, we get 7,200 watts. Well, now it says in watts, so we got that, boom. Now it wants it in horsepower. Well, if we take 7,200 watts, we know that, what, 746 watts? Oops, got it in the wrong place, didn't I? How do I know it's in the wrong place? Because I'm trying to get rid of watts. So I know 746 watts is, and is equal to one horsepower. So if I take 7200 and divide it by 746, I actually get 9.65 horsepower, which is the other piece of this, okay? So let's cruise on to the next example. So here we go, we've got power. Past the slow moving truck, you've got a mass right here. So we've got a mass. We've got an initial velocity and a final velocity. So this is velocity initial, this is velocity final, and we've got a time. All right, guys. So if we've got each one of those things, what we've got to figure out is how do we find power? What form do we need power in? Well, we know that power is equal to work divided by time. Well, one of the different uh, ways we can express work is what? Change in kinetic energy. So it's also change in kinetic energy over time. So now all we have to do is figure this out. Now, how did I know to do that? Because it gave me velocities. That was my clue. All right, so this is gonna be one half mass V final squared minus V initial squared. Notice I'm gonna square them before I subtract them. And then that's all gonna be over time. So let's actually plug in one half the mass, which is 1300. V final is 17.9 squared minus the initial 13.4 squared. And then we're going to take that and divide the whole thing by 3. If we do that, we're going to get the power is 30,517.5 watts. 
And that is the correct answer, okay? All right. Oh, now we're on an incline, so this ought to be fun. So if we're on an incline, we need to look at what we're written. What's written first, though? We're given a force. We're given a mass. Okay, that's awesome. Constant speed. So here's my problem. Delta K. We can't use delta K because constant speed if it's, is zero, isn't it? Change in kinetic energy is zero. We've got an angle right here. May or may not need that. We don't know. And we've got watts of energy. It says what's the speed? All right, so we have got power. We know that. That's this guy right here. That's my power, okay? So power is in watts. Now, what else do we know? We know a couple different versions of the power formula. One of the versions is what? Work divided by time, but I don't have work. But what I do have is a force and do I have a velocity? No, but I want velocity. But I also have a force, okay? So I have power and force. So what's another version of this? This isn't gonna help, I don't have a time. Well, the other version is force times velocity, isn't it? Okay, so look at what we have. We have power, we have force, so we can find velocity. So the power is 37,300 watts. The force is 1280 times the velocity. Divide both sides by 1280 and we get a velocity of 29.14 meters per second, which is correct. All right, so see, it require you to think about which formula to use. All right, so now, man lifts a 10 kilogram box three meters above his head with 150 newtons of force. So how much power? So we're looking for P. They've given us a force, so that might be a clue. All right, so we've got to find the force, the work done by the force. All right, so this is work over time. Okay, so this one's gonna be a little bit tougher. We don't have time, we don't have a velocity either. So we're gonna to have to either find one or the other. This is where knowing Newton's laws come in. When you don't know anything else, you've got to start figuring out, I need time. I need this. And I also need this. So how do I find the work? Well, work's going to be easy. It's going to be force times distance, isn't it? Well, that one's easy. I've got the force. I've got the distance. Check and check. What I need is the time. So... How do I figure out what the time is? Well, he starts at what? What do we know? He starts at some velocity zero because he's starting from rest. We know that he's going a change in distance of three meters. We don't know the time and we don't know the acceleration, do we? But we can do a free body diagram and figure out what the acceleration is. So let's do a free body diagram here. So if we do a free body diagram, we know we have what? Mass times gravity going this way, and we have some sort of applied force going this way. That's this guy, the applied force. So my mass times acceleration, the sum of the forces, right, has got to be equal to, it's lifting in this direction, the applied force minus mg. So I can figure this out. I know the mass is 10. Don't know the acceleration, the applied force is 150 minus the mass times gravity. So we've got 10A equals 150 minus 100 is 50. So A is five meters per second squared. So I know the acceleration is five meters per second squared. Now, how's it gonna help me? I still gotta find time. So there's that. So now to find time, I know that what? V, or distance, oh, I've got distance here. So I know distance is equal to V initial T plus one half AT squared, don't I? This is zero, because we said V initial was zero up here. So now we just plug in. We know this is three. This is one half. The acceleration is five times T squared. 
work that out and we get a t of 1.1 seconds. So now I have that. So now we're gonna plug into our power formula. My force is 150. It's being applied over three meters and it takes 1.1 seconds to do it. If you multiply all that together, you get 409.1 watts, which is what the answer is, okay? So that's my big power. All right, next one. Let's look at how can energy help the world? Oh, that's pretty cool. Let's move on. Let's talk about non-conservative forces. We looked at this earlier in class and you saw me write this up here. If we have conservative forces, it's this. If we have non-conservative forces, we have to take those into account. So we have initial me mechanical energy plus or minus some kind of non-conservative force. Now remember, it's gonna be minus if it's friction. It's gonna be minus if it's drag. It's gonna be plus if it's some applied in the direction of motion. Right? And that ends up with the final mechanical force. So it is gonna be negative if we're taking energy out. And it's gonna be positive if we add energy. This is like if we were to push a book across the floor, that would be positive energy, wouldn't it? All right, so let's, let's go back. Let's look at this. If we take this, we know we have U gravity plus U spring plus K initial. These are all initials, aren't they? plus some kind of non-conservative work is gonna be equal to U gravitational final plus U spring final plus K final. And of course, we'll zero out anything we don't need. So this is the guy that'll get us where we need to go. It's how we do these problems from beginning to end. All right? So, oh, hey, speaking. So example number 22. Notice we're gonna start the same way every single time. It says what velocity, we've got two kilogram block, initially at rest right here, so we're right here, at, I'm sorry, right here. This is the before, and in part A, this is the after, isn't it? We're, we wanna know what the box is gonna be at the top of the loop right here. It says what's the velocity at the top of the loop. So what we're gonna do for part A is we're gonna start with the mechanical energy part of this and we're gonna go mechanical energy in plus some non-conservative force. How do we know if it's non-conservative or not? Well, it's initially at rest on a frictionless surface, level ground, but then it lets go and it slides on a loop of radius 0.5. That assumes that there is some sort of non-conservative work going on equals the final mechanical energy. So what kind of initial energy do we have? If it's at rest, we don't have kinetic, do we? What do we have? Hold on. We don't have any kinetic, we don't have any gravitational, we don't have any spring, so this is zero. We are going to push with some sort of force across the distance. So this is gonna be adding in force times distance. And we're gonna end up with what? Well, at the top up here, we've got U gravitational plus kinetic energy, don't we? We don't have any spring energy, there's no spring. So let's fill in. This is FD equals MGH plus one half MV final squared. All right, so let's start plugging in what we know. The force we're plugging in was 10 Newtons over a distance of five meters. We know this is the two kilogram block, gravity's 10, H is what? What is H? What does it tell us? Radius of 0.5 meters. That means that the radius right here is 0.5. And this is also 0 0.5. So we have had an entire change from here to here of one meter. So this is gonna be one. 
plus one half the mass, which is two times V final squared. So we're gonna finish working this out. If we work this all the way out, we get a final velocity of 5.48 meters per second, which checks out. Now part B. Part B says, what's the velocity at the top of the loop? So now we're before here. We're not after here anymore. This is our after, okay? So we have some sort of mechanical energy in plus my non-conservative force equals mechanical energy out. So here we go. Let's look at what that's gonna be. Mechanical energy in, it starts at zero and it's at the bottom. So mechanical energy in is zero. We know this is FD final energy. This time, however, if it's at the top of the loop, what do we have here? Top of the loop, all we have is gravitational. So this now becomes MGH. Because why do we know it's nothing? What does it say? Max velocity. Right? Well, you can't see it on the screen, but you can see it on your paper. It says, what's the max height the block will reach? So max height implies that the velocity is zero, doesn't it? Remember, we learned this last time. So we've got MGH. So let's plug in what we know. This is 10, this is five. The mass is two, gravity is 10, and we are solving for H. This is easy. Divide both sides by 20, and we get the height is two, 0.5 meters, which is the answer. All right, non-conservative forces. You're gonna see us do every one of these problems and start them all the same way, right? It says how much non-conservative work, so we know we have non-conservative work, so we're gonna start with mechanical energy initial plus our work non-conservative equals our mechanical energy final. All right, so now we gotta figure out what kind of mechanical energy we have. We've got a leaf. Leaf starts where it has an initial height, so we know we have gravitational potential energy. It's starting from rest, so we don't have kinetic. We don't have spring. So all we have is potential and non-conservative. And then it says what happens when it hits the landing. So when it lands here, it doesn't have gravitational anymore. All it has is kinetic, doesn't it? Well, we probably ought to be consistent with this and say, it has kinetic energy final. So this is gonna be MGH plus what? It's getting, is it adding in? Is it pushing anything? It's not pushing, is it? It says non-conservative work. Okay, well, work non-conservative, we don't know. We're looking for that. And this is 1 half MV squared. So if we want non-conservative work, what we have to do is notice that we gotta get this by itself, which means we start with 1 half mv final squared, and we're gonna subtract the mgh to this side. So that's gonna give us our answer. So the non-conservative work, conservative work has to be, whatever the sign is on it will be what we get. So 1 half the mass of the leaf, the mass of the leaf was 0 0.017. The velocity when it hits the ground was 1.3, so it's 1.3 squared minus the mass of the leaf, 0, 0.17 times gravity. And how far did it fall? It said it fell 5.3 meters, so this would be 5.3 times 5.3. If we work this out and run the numbers, we get negative 0 0.89 joules, right? Because it's work, it's joules, it's not watts. All right, so the non-conservative work is negative. It means it was slowing it down. Well, if you have a leaf, picture a leaf falling. If we picture a leaf falling, here's our leaf. When it falls, it's gonna slowly slide back and forth, isn't it? Because as it hits the ground, and it's gonna hit the ground, but it's moving this way. Do you know what's causing it to stop? Think about it being all spread open wide. That is going to be air resistance. It's gonna have drag, isn't it? This is gonna be drag caused by caused by the air, okay? All right.
work non-conservative. Let's keep going. We've got a couple more examples, a bunch more examples to do here. 95 kilogram diver steps off a diving board and drops the water three meters below. So we've got a before here and we've got an after here. So this is before and this is after. We don't care whether or not what's going on right here. We just need to do before and after, don't we? So what do we know? We know the mechanical energy in plus some non-conservative force, because it says non-conservative work equals mechanical energy final. All right, so what type of mechanical energy do we have here? Well, he's standing there at rest, so he does not have kinetic. Kinetic energy is equal to zero. So what he's got is gravitational, doesn't he? MGH plus our work non-conform conservative, and he will be what? Diver comes to a rest. So what is the final energy? If he's at a rest, he's not moving, it's zero, isn't it? So if we wanna know the depth, there's no kinetic, there's no potential here, because this is our zero line right here, this is zero. So we know the mass of the diver is 95. We know gravity is 10. We don't know what the height is, the depth D is the height. This is gonna be equal to negative times the work non-conservative. I just moved this to the other side. So let's plug that in. Negative times a negative 5120. So this is 950 D equals that. Divide both sides by 950 and we get a depth of 2.39 meters. All right, so now, Non-conservative work, example number 25. All right, so here we go. We've got a block now with a mass of 0.5 kilograms. It's sliding. It's forced, against a, it's forced against a spring. So this is our before. This is equilibrium. This is our before, and this is our after. All right, so let's work this out. What do we have? First thing we need, we need to know what the coefficient of kinetic friction is. So we know if there's friction that there's a non-conservative force. So we have mechanical energy initial plus my work non-conservative equals mechanical energy final. All right, so here we go. We know we have, spring is compressed, so we have potential energy, spring potential energy. We don't have any gravitational, we don't have, it's not moving, it's at a rest, so we don't have any kinetic either. This is work non-conservative. And mechanical energy final means it's moving, right? We have kinetic energy here. Okay. Oh, nope, be careful. Look what it says. Horizontal table goes for one meter before it comes to a rest. So afterwards, this thing, there's no kinetic energy either, is there? There's nothing. There's zero over here. So what can we figure out? We can figure out what the non-conservative force is. How's it gonna help me? Well, what's the non-conservative force gonna be? It's gonna be the frictional work done by friction, isn't it? So this is done by friction. So if we can figure out what this is, maybe we can figure out what that coefficient of kinetic friction is gonna be. So we know that the non-conservative work is gonna be equal to negative spring potential energy, which is negative one half kx squared. So let's figure out what that is. So this is negative one half, coefficient spring constant is 100, and it moved it how far? Here's the compression, 0 0.2 squared. That gives me a non-conservative work of negative two joules. So how's it gonna help me? Well, work non-conservative is gonna be the force, negative force times the distance. Well, what is that force? It's the force of friction. Remember what the force of friction is. So we know this is negative two, and this is negative. Force of friction is gonna be mu sub kinetic, because it's moving times the normal force. Well, since this is on a, if we looked at this guy right here, normal force goes this way, doesn't it? That's opposite mg. 
So the normal force, this becomes negative mu sub k mg times the distance. So that's negative 2. So let's plug in. Negative and negative can go away, so we can make this positive. Mu sub k. Mass is what? Mass is 0 0.5. Gravity is 10. And it slid 1 meter. Okay? So if we plug that in and solve for mu sub k, multiply that, we get 5, 2 divided by 5. So we get mu sub k is equal to 0 0.4. And remember, there are no units for this. So if I have to find the coefficient of kinetic friction, the easiest way to do that would be to find the non-conservative force and then use that knowing to find the frictional force over the distance, all right? Example 26. Here we go. We've only got a few left. All right, here we are. We've got a skier. He's going, what is he doing? Moving straight across the snow-covered plateau, hits a rough patch, and then goes down a mountain. So we know this is the beginning. And she says, so what does it say? Skier, 62 kilogram skier, moving at 6.5 meters per second, frictionless, horizontal, snow-covered plateau when she encounters a rough patch. So it's frictionless, then she gets a rough patch. Coefficient of friction right there, we've got some rough patch, and then returns to friction-free snow. She skis down an icy, frictionless hill. So we've got no friction here, we've got friction here, and then we've got no friction here. Okay. So... What do we know we have going on here? We know it's not conservative. We have initial mechanical energy plus work non-conservative equals mechanical energy final. All right, so what type of mechanical energy do we have to begin with? What do we have? Well, we have, she's above our zero line, isn't she? So this is our zero line. So we know she has gravitational potential. She has kinetic right? Because we want to know when she gets to the bottom of the hill. So this is my before and this is my after right here. So there is a change in height, isn't there? There's a delta y right here. She has kinetic, she has potential, um, gravitational potential, and this we know is frictional times the distance. She ends with what? Well, she's at the bottom, so she no longer has gravitational We've done the work non-conservative, so the only thing left is how fast is she moving. So we have K final. This is K initial, that's K final. So you can see how we can do before and after again as we go. So this is MGH, one half M V initial squared, force of friction times the distance, one half M V final squared. Okay, so now we gotta find the force of friction though, so we gotta do a Free body diagram right here for this section. Free body diagram right there says we've got mg going down and we have normal force going up. So the normal force is equal to mg, right? And then we have the force of friction going this way. But we know force of friction, so we've got mgh here, one half mv initial squared here this is gonna be negative, isn't it? Force of friction is minus because it's going opposite the direction. Mu sub K, Mg, D. This is normal force. This is my normal force times the distance equals 1 half Mv final squared. So let's fill in everything we know. First thing we know is every one of these has an M, so I'm gonna get rid of that. So we have gravity, which is 10, the height of the hill, which is two and a half meters high. Initial velocity is 6.5. Coefficient of friction is 0.3, so mine is 0 0.3. Gravity is 10. The rough patch was 4.3 meters, so that's the distance it was applied. 1 half V final squared. When we work this whole thing out, we get a final velocity 
of 8.15 meters per second. Okay. Notice we started with the same thing here and I just looked at my picture and asked myself, do I have at the beginning point, between the beginning point and the ending point? Notice I, I put those in. What was at the beginning? Where am I at the end? And then I looked for the different types of energy. We're up above where we're gonna end, so we have gravitational. We're moving velocity, so we have kinetic. We've got friction, so we've got a non-conservative force. At the end, we're just moving, we're at our zero line, so it's just kinetic. All right, non-conservative. We've got a package here, right here that starts at point A. Sorry, right here, so this is my beginning. This is my before. It reaches, slides down the track and reaches point B with a speed of 4.8 meters per second, okay? So 4.8 meters per second. And it reaches the speed right here. We've got a velocity of 4.8. So we have kinetic at that point. From point B, it slides on a level surface where it comes to rest. So now we have a velocity of zero here. B final is equal to zero. So something had to happen in between. That means this thing had to slow down, so we had to have friction here, didn't we? It says, what's the coefficient of friction on the horizontal surface? Okay, so let's write this out. What do we have going on? We have before and we have what? After, this is our after. So mechanical energy initial, this is part A, plus our work non-conservative equals mechanical energy final. This is our before. Our before, it said released from rest. So we have an initial velocity of zero, which means the only thing we have is gravitational potential energy. Plus our work non-conservative. Final energy, we still got zero here. It's at the bottom, so we don't have any gravitational, we don't have any kinetics since it's at rest, so this is zero. All right, so now we know what is the non-conservative force being applied? It's friction, isn't it? So we can now say this is gravitational minus, work conservative would be the force of friction times D equals zero. Well, this is MGH. Force of friction is gonna be the coefficient of kinetic friction times the normal force times D equals zero. So let's keep going here. Here we are. Bring this stuff to the other side. We've got MGH equals mu sub K. We need to figure out what normal force is. So the normal force along here is the box right here is where there's friction. The normal force is just MG going down and normal force is going up. So the normal force right here is MG. So this becomes mg d. So now we can find the coefficient of friction, can't we? All right, so fill in. We've got m here and m here. We've got g here and g here. Both of those go away, don't they? Okay, so what do we have left? We have a height of 1.6 meters equals mu sub k, which we don't know, times the distance of three. If we divide those out, 1.6 divided by three, we get a mu sub k of 0 0.384. So that was easy enough. So that's the first part. So now that's part A. So part B, it says how much work is done by the friction as it slides down? So in part B, we're gonna do work non-conservative, that's the part done by friction, is the force of friction times the distance, isn't it? Well, we just said that was mu sub k times mg times d, so let's fill those in. We know this is 0 0.384. We know the mass of the box, it said was 0 0.2. Gravity is 10 and it slid under gravity from here to here, which is three. So this is times three. So if we multiply all of those together, we know this is gonna to be negative too, don't we? Won't it be negative? 
will be negative because it's slowing it down. It's taking energy out. So the work non-conservative is negative 0 0.896, and that's joules. If you multiply all those things together, that's what you should get. All right, conceptual question now. What is the conceptual question? It says a golfer badly misjudges a putt, sending the ball only a quarter of the way from the hole. Okay, initial velocity of V initial. So we know our before on this guy, our before is here and our after is here, right? Okay, so we know, and then we know there's friction in between because it comes to a rest. So we have friction here. So for this guy, our before is one half mv, what, initial squared? Minus the force of friction times the distance equals, it comes to a rest, so it's zero. Now, what that means is one half mv initial squared equals force of friction times the distance. All right. So what is, we know force of friction times distance is equal to one half mv initial squared. All right, so let's go with the second one. It says, what's the initial speed to get the ball into the hole? So we've got to go 4d now. So let's set this up again down here. And we've got four choices, a, b, c, or d. So in the second choice, Mechanical energy initial plus my work non-conservative equals mechanical energy final. Well, we've already said it comes to a halt right here, doesn't it? So this is zero. We know mechanical energy here. It starts with some half, some mv squared. We're not needing the initial this time because we're looking for some force. It's initial velocity v. It says what initial speed v We'll get the ball into the hole. So this has got to be in terms of the original initial velocity minus, again, that frictional force times D only. This time it's not just D, is it? What is it? It's four times that distance. So it is now 4D right here. So let's solve this again. One half M V squared equals four times the force of friction times D. Well, that's okay because we know this. Didn't we just find this? Force of friction times distance is right up here. It's one half V initial squared. Isn't that what this says? So let's plug that in. So let's go over here. We have one half MV squared equals four times one half MV initial squared. Cool. So now we can solve for what M's go away. We can multiply both sides by two. So now we have final velocity squared, V squared, where this velocity squared is eight. Half of eight is four V initial squared. Well, how do we find this? We take the square root, don't we? So V is equal to half, uh, square root of four, which is two times V initial. And the answer to that one is right here. So the answer is A. Notice I used the first situation to get it in, ter in terms of the initial velocity and use the second situation. And in the second situation, I solved for what was on the other side over here again. And where I found the, that part that was on the other side, I substituted in. I took this from the first part of the problem and plugged it in there. Right? Example 28. I'm getting close. We got three examples to go and we're done. All right, example 28, we've got non-conservative. Two kilogram block pushed against a spring with a mass compressing it. So we know it starts compressed, so it starts here. This is our before. The block is released, it moves along a frictionless incline with a slope of 37 degrees. It says, what's the speed of the block as it slides along the horizontal surface after having left the spring? So in part A, this is our after. So 
So we want to know what our after is right here. All right, so, and this is what? Horizontal surface, frictionless horizontal surface. So this actually is conservation of energy works here, doesn't it? So in part A, we have mechanical energy in. We don't have any non-conservative force because it's frictionless mechanical energy out. So what do we know? Our mechanical energy in is spring potential energy and our mechanical energy out is, oops, sorry, is kinetic energy, final. Okay, so this is one half kx squared here and this is one half mv squared here. So we can get rid of the one halves. Spring constant is 400. It compressed at 0.22, so that's 0.22 squared. The mass of the block is two, and we're looking at the velocity squared here, velocity final squared. If you solve for the final velocity, you should get 3.11, which is what we'll see here. So this is 3.11 meters per second. All right, so now in part B, it says how far does the block travel up the incline before it starts to slide back down. In other words, what happens the second time before it starts to slide back down, this is now our after point here, isn't it? This is after, and that tells us our velocity is, our final velocity is zero. So let's do a mechanical energy before and after here. All right, so we now have, for part B, we now have mechanical energy initial. It is still no friction, isn't it? It's still a smooth surface. So mechanical energy in still equals mechanical energy final. Well, we initially start with spring potential energy and this time we're gonna end with zero so we end up with gravitational potential energy right there. So we know this is one half kx squared and this is mgh, isn't it? All right, so one half K is 400, this is 0 0.22. We get the mass of the block is two, G is 10, and we wanna know H. So we find H. H is 0 0.48 meters. Problem is, is that's not the answer to the problem. It says, how far does it travel up the incline? What we just found in H just so you know, what we just found in H was this height right here, H. What we want to know is this distance right here, D. But we know this angle is 37 degrees, don't we? So we have a right triangle. So if we have a right triangle, what we can do is set this up and say, all right, if this is 37 degrees and this is 0 0.48, what is this distance D? Well, this is opposite and hypotenuse, so we have sine. So we simply set this up as the sine of the angle, 37 degrees is equal to opposite divided by hypotenuse. We can now swap across the equal sign, can't we? So we have D equals 0 0.48 divided by the sine of 37 degrees. And we get a distance it slides up the incline of 0 0.8 meters. Throw it in your calculator, make sure you're in degrees, and see what you got. All right, okay. Last example. Here we go. All right. Oh, nope, sorry, we got one more. 29. I thought we were on 29, we're on 28. Okay, here we go. Sorry, two examples. 1.2 kilogram block released at point A. So this is initial velocity is zero. So this is my before but it does have gravitational potential energy, doesn't it? So at point A, we have kinetic energy is zero, gravitational potential energy of MGH, and that's it. We're gonna slide down a frictionless surface until it encounters a rough patch. So we've got a rough patch from here to here, so now we know we have friction. And after point C, the surface is frictionless and the spring compresses. So then we're gonna have a compressed spring right here. 
and it comes to a rest. So we have a V final of zero also. So here we know we have kinetic energy is zero. We have no gravitational, but we have spring potential energy of one half kx squared, don't we? So this is my problem. I have mechanical energy initial. I hit non-conservative work. You know how I know that? Because I've got friction in here and I end up with some sort of mechanical energy final. Mechanical energy initial is just this MGH. It's our gravitational potential energy we found at the beginning point. Because this is, remember, this is my before and this is my after. Minus friction, so the force of friction times the distance it traveled equals after is just spring potential energy. So this is one half kx squared. So let's work this out. Force of friction, if we did the free body diagram right here, right? Because we need to know the force of friction. This right here is going to be mg down. And this is normal force. Force of friction is this direction. But we know that the force of friction is mu sub k times the normal force. So this is going to be mu sub k times mg, isn't it? Isn't the normal force just this? All right, so we have mgh minus mu sub k mg equals 1 half kx squared. So we are looking for k. So let's fill everything in we know here. So what do we know? We know the mass of the block is 1.2 kilograms. Gravity is 10, and we know it fell three meters. So this three minus mu sub k spring constant was 0 0.19. Mass of the block is 1.2, gravity is 10 times d, excuse me. Oop, I almost left d out. It went six meters. One half K, which we don't know, but we do know it compresses the spring 0 0.022, and that's squared. So now all we have to do is work all this out. We're gonna find this, gonna find this and subtract it. We're gonna multiply by two and divide by 0 0.022 squared. And we end up with a K of 92,231.4, and we know spring constant is newtons per meter. All right, last example. This one should be the easiest one yet, because we did something on here. We know work done on the graph. Work done, if you have a force displacement graph, force times displacement is work, isn't it? So work is equal to the area under a force versus displacement graph. In other words, if I want to know the total work done here, I just need to find the total area here. This is the work. So what I'm going to do is divide this up into two chunks. I'm going to divide it up into this chunk, which I can find the area of, which is a rectangle. And then I'm going to divide it up into this chunk right here, which is the triangle. So, my total work is going to be equal to the work done of the rectangle plus the work done of the triangle. So let's find the work done by the rectangle. It is going to be base, which is 20, times the height, which is 100. This is a triangle, so it is now 1 half base. This time from 20 to 30 is 10. And the height is the same, which is 100. So we're going to get 2,000 here plus 500 here, which gives us a total of 2,500 joules. So we know that the work on a force displacement graph, force here, displacement here, the work is the area under the curve. You need to know that. All right, that's the end of your notes for this time. You need to make sure you've taken your notes and be ready to complete homework two and start on homework three next time.